third lecture. Okay, let's, my mic live? It sounds like it is. Okay, so let me uh, begin with two pre-apologies. One is that the material for this lecture, for reasons of time, might uh, end up getting slightly spilled over into the next lecture. We'll just ha I'll have to break whenever the time, whenever the crickets tell me to break. Um, and the other thing is that I should apologize for not having a pile of brightly colored, uh, colored powder to throw at you this time of year. Uh, if you don't know what that means, ask the people who are laughing. Uh, uh, okay, so today I want to talk about sheaves. Let me not do it this marker. Let me do a, let's try this. No. Something I can actually write with. Let's see. So I'm going to pick up where Jared left off yesterday afternoon. So Jared told us about uh, this construction of Farg and Fontaine that essentially uh, describes in a geometric way, the, the untilts of an algebraically closed perfectoid field of characteristic P. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, first uh, the kind of relative analog of that construction, which allows you to give a geometric description of untilts of perfectoid rings and ultimately perfectoid spaces by some sort of gluing. Um, and then I want to move into talking about sheaves, especially vector bundles, although some of this will apply to pseudo-coherent sheaves. Um, so we want to talk about sheaves on these special attic spaces and what they have to do both with traditional p attic Hodge theory and also with um, the sort of exciting direction that the field is going right now, um, i.e. sort of making sense of the concept of Stukas and, and, and concepts from geometrical Englands. Uh, so this will segue that, that way into, into the very last lecture. So, so, uh, so throughout this lecture, I'm going to fix a perfectoid pair in characteristic P, and to keep track of the fact that it's characteristic P, I'll call it R rather than A. Because I'm going to be ta today taking the focus uh, to the question of wh what are the untilts of this. So rather than starting from the characteristic zero object, today I want to think about you know, the geometry, so to speak, of the space of untilts of this particular thing. Um, and to simplify matters at several points, uh, instead of allowing R to be analytic, I'm going to actually insist that it be Tate and fix a pseudo-uniformizer topologically no potent unit, far pi. Um, uh, there are actually some genuine subtleties in the analytic case, uh, which I will gloss over. They're discussed in the notes. Um, but for the most part, you can treat this story locally and then glue to talk about concepts over general perfectoid spaces. Um, so the basic player uh, in the story today is a ring um, called A inf. I think we saw, maybe already saw a special case of this uh, in the previous lecture. So inf stands for infinitesimal. Uh, we won't see the reason why that interpretation is so infinitesimal. We won't see the justification for that terminology right now. Um, I guess we maybe will see it more in, in, in Parker's lectures. Um, so we're going to take the, we're going to I mean, we've already seen this ring plenty during my previous lecture, right? I, I, I used this ring to talk about um, a primitive ideal, and I used this to, to construct untilts, right? The, uh, the way I untilted was I chose some clever ideal in here with one of these nice kind of monic polynomial type generators, and then I quotiented that, by, that to get an A plus, and then if you uh, invert the right things, that gives you... Um, a perfectoid ring, uh, possibly out of characteristic P. So this will be this ring will be the center of player. Um, it's complete for the uh, P comma var bracket var pi attic topology, as 
as was in the case when R was an algebraically closed field, as in Jared's lecture. Um, so this is a Huber ring, which is not analytic. So most, whenever I've been talking about Huber rings up to now, I've been trying to only talk about analytic ones, but this, is, this one is not. So uh, I have to handle it with a bit of caution, um, right? Because, well, the, top, the topologically potent elements um, form an ideal with a non-trivial quotient. The quotient is, uh, uh, well, let me say it this way. If I, take, if I form the spa of this thing using itself as the plus subring, then Inside here, I have a copy of spec of let's see, r plus mod r um, circle circle. These are the topologically no potent elements. So for example, if r is a field, perfectoid field, I don't really need to say perfectoid, but that. If R is a perfectoid field, uh, then this is a single point. Well, I can say, in general, this is the locus where um, P and var pi are simultaneously zero. But in the case where an R is a perfectoid field, this is a single point. And I'll draw a cartoon of this in a moment. Actually, let me just go ahead and draw it now. Uh, the, yeah, this is, uh, well, maybe I should say, uh, in general, uh, the complement of this set is an analytic attic space. Well, it's an, uh, that's two statements. One is an easy statement that all of the valuations away from this locus are actually non-trivial. And the other one is that something is sheafy. So I'll come back to the sheafy part in a moment. But first, let me draw the picture. So the picture, so this cartoon is actually uh, from Argos notes. Um, well, if R is a field, I'll draw, I'll actually draw the general case below. So the cartoon in the case of a field is, uh, so I'm going to draw a two-dimensional picture, although take that with some caution in a moment. So I'm going to put down here a point. Uh, where p and var pi both vanish. That's a, so that's down here. And then over here, there's a point, there's a single point where p equals zero, but var pi does not equal zero. And then over here, there's a single point where um, var pi bracket equals zero, but p not equals zero. And then there's a whole bunch of points in the middle. And then over here, there's also a point where um, uh, the, which one is this? This is the, uh, this sort of a generic point. Yes. Uh, no, sorry. I probably do need to draw that generic point. Um, so remember the, the, so this looks like a two-dimensional picture, but really you're supposed to imagine that once I take this out, this thing behaves like a curve. Um, so somehow the reason this is not really a two-dimensional picture is because 
Remember, my valuations don't have any intrinsic normalization. They're just comparisons between values. So there's no way to rescale this, uh, this valuation. Sort of if, once you set p equals 0, you have a valuation on, uh, on r, but it doesn't have any intrinsic normalization. That's part of this attic setup. Um, if you insist on normalizing things, you get a slightly different theory, which I call reified attic spaces, which would give you an extra dimension here, but we're not doing that right now. Um, so when you take this point out, um, what's left behind is actually something that behaves like a one-dimensional space. Um, and it behaves like that in a, in, a, in a more precise way. We'll see the algebraic uh, reasons why this behaves. Actually, maybe I can even say this. So, um, so the, the analytic locus, i.e. the complement of this stuff, uh, in this case, is covered by attic, the attic spectra of principal ideal domains. So this thing really has the structure of a one-dimensional object. Oh, sorry, which one? This one, over, uh, the, the generic guy? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, if I take out pi equals zero, if I remove also. Yeah, there's some non-Noetherian behavior that has sort of happens around this point. Um, yeah, so in a moment, I'll take out this point and this point also. Um, although this point, I'll have to put back in later. But um, yeah, actually, let's go ahead and think about what happens when I take these two points out. OK, so now I've taken out. Um, so now s suppose I consider uh, what I think Jared called y. I'll call it y sub. S, S is going to be my notation for the spa of this thing. I could write Y sub R as well. Um, so Jared wrote this with a curly Y, but I'm only, I'm not going to have both the curly and the straight ones. So, um, so this is the locus where both P and var pi are simultaneously non-zero. So I have to take out like the axes here. So I, I get this stuff in the middle. OK, so now this statement really becomes valid. This thing looks like um, a bunch of pieces, which are the attic spectra of PIDs. And in fact, you can say more than that. Not only are these obviously Noetherian rings because they're principal ideal domains, but they're also strongly Noetherian. Uh, all the Tate algebra is over. So you can prove the Hilbert basis theorem for pieces of this. So this means you can deal with, well, you can apply all the formalism of attic spaces that you read about in Huber's book, and you can talk about coherent sheaves as well as vector bundles and so on. Um, so, and, and this does not require R to be algebraically closed. Um, this will be useful later, that this works for general fields, perfectoid fields, of course. So if I take this, this part of the picture, so this sort of open, uh, curve, if you like, um, then what, I'm, what I want to do is look at the action of uh, the Witt vector Frobenius on this thing. So remember, the Witt vector construction is functorial. If you, take in a per, if you take a perfect ring of characters to P, you do this crazy thing with power series P, P you get back out a ring in a functorial way. So any map between rings of characteristic P lifts to a map of these crazy power series. And that in particular applies to the Frobenius map, which does something quite simple. It raises all the characteristic p things to their p -th powers. Um, and so that induces a map on from a inf to itself um, that fixes, um, it, fixes p, it fixes the point where p equals 0, because it doesn't do anything about p. Um, it fixes this because, OK, it raises var pi to its pth power, but that doesn't move the, pull, the pulling back by that doesn't change this valuation. And obviously, it doesn't move this either. So it fixes all this stuff. But it moves this stuff around in an interesting way. Um, it moves it around towards, let's see if I get this direction right. It's moving it towards um, 
Uh, let's see. So var pi is, I drew this in my notes. Let me get this. So according to my notes, it's go, it goes up. So I have var pi going sort of on the geometric, the geometric map, pi, var pi star, maybe I should call it, uh, sort of goes, well, it goes in one direction. It's not actually critical yet which direction it goes, but it goes in, it goes in one direction. And so it's actually inducing a free action on this stuff. Um, so yeah, there's a generic point I should ignore. but. Uh, Oh, no, sorry, you're right. On the spec, there's a generic point, which I would ignore. But I, I want to do this on the attic space anyway, because I want to say that this is actually a free action. This has no fixed points. Because, I, I mean, I took out the fixed points. So uh, that means I can take a quotient, which, again, we did uh, last time in the case of an algebraically closed field. So the group generated by phi acts freely on ys, and the quotient is called fs, xs, but I'll also call it F, ffs for the far, because this is the attic the attic farg fontaine curve over s. Yes. Uh, the entire, I'm taking away this entire vertical line, but this actually only consists of, in, right now, R is a field, this only consists of this point and this point. I mean, there's nothing really in between because, as I said, you, can, you don't have an intrinsic choice of a normalization. Well, already if I take away this point, the comp, the, I get something analytic. But the action of phi has two fixed points that I also want to remove for this for this purpose. As I said, in the next lecture, I'll have to talk about what happens when I put this point back. But for the moment, I want to, for this lecture, I want to take out all the fixed points. And so I get a free action here. And so there's no confusion about what this means. This is literally the quotient. It's a free action. I can literally form the quotient in the category of locally V-ring spaces. It will again be an attic space. And this is the space it is. Oh, well, again, modulo the fact that, that uh, um, that I started with an attic space. So this, I should make a comment, this is an attic space because of the strongly Noetherian property. Because it's built out of rings that are strongly Noetherian. I mean, there's another reason, which we'll see in a moment, but this is, this is one justification for why you actually get an attic space. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, in the case over a point, that's the space that I'm interested in talking about. Um, and I should maybe just mention the kinds of rings that you get here. The kinds of rings you get here are things like, um, uh, say a invert a inf invert say p, and then you have things like um, you have ratios of this form, p a over var pi to the b, uh, p to var pi to the c over p to the d. So this is supposed to look like what would happen if you had Right, so this is, there's a strong analogy between A inf and something like, say, ZP double brackets T, a two-dimensional local ring. Um, this is not a two-dimensional local ring. It's not an Ethereum ring um, because you have problems with, you know, very, very small powers of var pi, but Nonetheless, there's, there's sort of an analogy between this cartoon and the cartoon you would get by trying to draw the spa of this thing. So uh, 
that's useful for keeping track of what's supposed to happen in the situation. And these things, these things turn out to be strongly Noetherian. Um, so I, I realized that I promised one thing that I don't want to say too much about, but let me just say in passing, um, you can also write down affinoid subspaces around uh, this point that are, uh, that are Noetherian. Um, and th that ends up giving you examples of interesting rings that are Tate, but not um, QP uh, algebras. Like, for example, you might have something like this, where instead of inverting P, I could have inverted um, bracket var pi. And then if I do something where I don't actually throw P in the denominator, like I do something like this, then I'm getting something which where I have, this thing is a topologically nilpotent, this bracket var pi is a topologically nilpotent unit, but uh, P is not a unit, if I take this out. So that would be like a neighborhood of this point. And then I can sort of make a perfectoid version of this, which is useful for, useful in a moment. Um, and that would be a natural example, but, but for example, I can throw in P to the one over P to the N for all N. Maybe I should actually write something here. I think this has gone too long. So aside, neighborhoods of the point P equals zero, var pi not equal to zero, look like, well, some neighborhoods look like um, spa of a and f adjoin inverse of var pi, um, also adjoin something like p to the a over var pi to the b, angle brackets. Ah, sorry about that. And then comma, some appropriate ring of integral elements. And adjoining an infinite system of p power roots of p gives a reasonably natural example of a perfectoid ring, which is Tate, but not um, a QP algebra. So this, is, so this kind of example is one reason why you don't want to just consider uh, QP algebras in the definition of a perfectoid ring. Because it's, well, we'll see in a moment. This works in the relative case, and this gives you a way to show that things are, are uh, stably uniform. So let me just jump ahead to that. Relative case. So first, the cartoon. So again, the analytic locus. So I can again consider the analytic locus, which is taking out um, so, which is the complement of, of um, the joint zeros of P and var pi. Um, I can then take that down to the set Ys, which is the set where P, the, the complement of, of the union of the zero loci. And then I can again quotient by the action of, of so the picture in this case is uh, some sort of relative version of the picture that I had last time. So, uh, you know, I'm a mathematician, not an art student. So uh, maybe I shouldn't even try to draw more than this. <laughs> um, so imagine taking this picture and, you know, lifting it in a different direction. So you have these things, right? So if I, like, say my pen is... Um, is spa of RR plus, then you have some picture that looks like this that's fibered. Well, now this is about to disappear, unfortunately. Um, so you have a picture that looks like the thing I had before, fibered over S, which was spa RR plus. So you have like a family. So if you have YS here, you have a family of these curves that somehow looks like it's fibered over S. Um, you have this action phi, 
a fee that sort of moves everything, and it's a free action, and you can again divide, and this gives you excess, which looks like some sort of circle bundle um, over S. So I should say this cartoon is actually slightly more than a cartoon. Um, if you, instead of considering attic spaces, you consider their, so attic spaces are usually not Hausdorff, but if you kind of crush the higher rank points, you get the ma a maximal Hausdorff quotient, um, which is something akin to a Berkovich space. Um, if you crush those things down, you get something where this picture actually is a valid picture at the level of homotopy type. Um, this, the, the, this, this XS will actually literally have the homotopy type of a circle bundle over the base. So this picture is valid at the level of Hausdorff quotients Um, well, so it's up to, you know, in a hope, you know, so to speak, working up to homotopy. Yes, so I said, so I should, I should emphasize this, this is, this is a picture of topological spaces. This is a picture of topological spaces. This would be a picture of topological spaces. This is not a map of attic spaces. I'm going to write this in capital letters because it's important. Um, this, that's the sense in which this is still a cartoon. Um, this is not a picture of a map of attic spaces. This is an attic space of characteristic P. This thing is an attic space where I got to invert P. So now this thing is actually lives over, over QP. This cannot be a map of attic spaces because the characteristics are all wrong. Um, this is a map of topological spaces, though. Um, it turns out it's also a map of Atoll sites. Um, it has even more structure than that. And um, uh, once we uh, start talking about uh, the language of diamonds, which I think we'll start doing uh, when Jared gives his final lecture, then we can actually give some semblance of meaning to this in some genuine category. But for the moment, this is, a car this is still a cartoon in the sense that this picture only makes sense on some topological level, not on some... Uh, sheaf of rings level. So this is an important, important distinction. Nonetheless, one wants to call this thing the, the attic relative Farg-Fontaine curve. Over S. So this, I should say that the Farg-Fontaine construction was for, was for perfectoid fields originally. Um, I think Leo and I were the first people to try to consider this relative situation. But once we get to the next lecture, you'll see in retrospect that it was very natural to have done this. Although we didn't realize exactly why it was so natural at the time. Okay, so this is the cartoons. Now maybe we should go back to doing some mathematics. Um, So I'll, I'll just allude to the, the, the key fact that's going to help us take this out of the cartoon world and into some more structural world is the fact that um, um, if, I, if I choose a, an untilt of S, call it S sharp, so this will be spa of, if you want R sharp, some R sharp plus, Then what happens is I get the following thing. So, so I have, um, let's say, I should say over QP, I should say. So let me take an untilt that genuinely gets out of characteristic P into characteristic zero. So not this trivial untilt, for example, and not some weird mixed characteristic thing. Um, so then, so I have a map that I write uh, with dashed arrows because it's only a map of topological spaces. This is only a topological map. 
Um, and then I have a, a, a homeomorphism here, which is also only topological. But now it turns out that I actually have a genuine map like this. This is genuine, this is an actual map of attic spaces. This is even, it's actually a closed immersion. And it's actually a section of, so if I put this map and this map together, I get a section of this projection. So the cartoon interpretation of this is that the untilts, i.e. untilts, of S uh, over QP corresponds to, sort of give rise to, uh, um, sections of this projection. Now, I'm being sloppy here because um, there's a quotient by Frobenius here. So this untilts are really somehow modulo the identification of S with its image under Frobenius. So in the next lecture, we'll be more careful about this, and we'll see what the effect of making that identification is. So this really, I should write sort of modulo the action of Frobenius on S. Um, so the choices of untilt of S modulo kind of hitting S with Frobenius correspond, and these things have to be genuine link characters of zero, somehow give rise to sections, and it turns out you can sort of go the other way. Yeah, this, this section, yeah, the, so the sections somehow, right, if I were to sort of take sections in here, like each section, right, that, right over a point, remember, this means that, you know, there are different points and the residue fields are all different, but they're all untilts of the same thing downstairs. So this is sort of the ring theoretic version, where, but instead of a point, you have to have a whole section. So uh, I like to think of this, uh, and this is, again, not a complete... Uh, fantasy is that there's some kind of homotopy equivalence between these different uh, sections. So the, the way this picture emerged for me originally is that I was working on the level of these Hausdorff, Hausdorff quotients, and uh, there were a, there are actually some strong topological statements you can make about you know homotopy retracts and so on that are genuinely true on this topological level. Um, but you know to promote them to the attic space level needs some extra work, and the basic idea here is that if, you, if you're willing to neglect the difference between X, S and S sharp, you can actually um, kind of turn this arrow at least into a genuine arrow like this. And by being more systematic about this, this is what gives you uh, the concept of diamonds that we'll see uh, tomorrow. Okay. So that's the geometric setup. So I'll come back to, to more about that next time, but now I want to start talking about sheaves on these things, especially vector bundles. I did leave myself some out for that. So for the rest of this hour, that was 50 minutes, we'll look at sheaves, especially vector bundles, on these relative Varg Fontan curves. And the goal, so one of the motivations, um, this was uh, one of the principal motivations of Farg and Fontaine originally in the non-relative version, is that when S is a point, these vector bundles um, relate to objects that had been previously studied uh, in P. Attic Hodge theory, these are things called phi gamma modules, which are used to analyze representations from, say, the Galois group of some field to the to a finite dimensional QP vector space. Um, so, right, classically in P. Attic Hodge theory. These are the kind of things that you get, say, from a tall cohomology of varieties, and you use these funny analytic methods to, to analyze these things to construct p periods um, 
to distinguish between things that look like they have geometric origin and don't so that you can, for example, formulate the fontaine maser conjecture. You do a lot of this. Um, now, it turns out that this theory, it's been kind of moving in this direction for a couple of decades by now, which is a little bit disconcerting for me to say because that, I've been involved with that story for about that time. Uh, so we've been moving in the general direction of a geometric interpretation of this that is consistent with um, an even more classical um, theory of vector bundles on algebraic curves, or Riemann surfaces, if you prefer. Right? This is one of the great successes of algebraic geometry um, in the sort of not quite late 20th century. Um, you know, the, uh, studying vector bundles on curves is how you, for example, construct moduli spaces of curves. You construct. Uh, you, basically, you construct all the moduli spaces in, that you want in algebraic geometry from concepts that, that tie into this, especially things like geometric invariant theory, or GIT, as it's called for short. So the concepts that I want to introduce are going to be related to concept in geometric invariant theory. And, and of course, the reason what, that Rochwan and I got started thinking about this picture is because we wanted to relativize all of this to study, well, the analog of Galois representations are, if you want, representations of fundamental groups. Or if you want, local systems. But I'll say more about those next time. So this is the motivation for having a detailed study of vector bundles. So now, for most of the rest of the hour, let me talk about the case uh, over a point. And maybe I'll just mumble some words at the end with whatever time I end up with about the relative case. I'll have more about that next time. Um, actually, no, let me do one thing before I specialize to the relative case. Um, so vector bundles, so we're interested in vector bundles on one of these relative farg fontaine curves, which by construction um, is this space Ys, this sort of open curve divided by the action of Frobenius superscript. So there's sort of a formal equivalence between vector bundles on a quotient space by the action of a group and equivariant bundles on the total space for the action of the group. So uh, it will be convenient to write down some examples of vector bundles uh, on here by writing down equivariant vector bundles upstairs. So for example, this is how I'm going to construct uh, O of 1, this sort of, which will be in some sense the standard ample line bundle on the relative farm fontaine curve. So by definition, O of 1 will be, I'm going to specify it as a phi equivariant vector bundle upstairs, but then it will give rise to a vector bundle downstairs. Uh, so this will be the free bundle on one generator V. So it's upstairs it's trivial, but the action of phi on it will be non-trivial. So what I have to do to specify the action is I have to specify an isomorphism between the phi pullback of O of 1 and O of 1. And so that this is generated by, so to speak, 1 times V. Right, I'm viewing sort of on the ring level, I'm taking, I'm tensoring over the base, some one base ring with another via Frobenius. Um, this thing will correspond to, if I've done this correct normalization correctly, P inverse times V. And the normalization is set up so that the normalization, if I've done it, done it right, um, so that O of minus 1 will not have many sections, but O of 1 will have lots of sections. 
In fact, we even saw these sections last time. Um, we saw this space last time. This was um, the thing that, so uh, Jared has this ring BC, which is essentially the global sections of the structure sheaf on YS. And this was the phi equals P part of that. So BC is, if you like, the global sections of the structure sheaf on Y, which has an action of phi from the action of phi on the space. And so this thing has a, an interpretation as a, a, what Colmes calls a Bonnock space with capital letters. The rest of us generally call it a Bonnock Colmes space. BC space, I want to abbreviate that. We'll see these again. Jared will talk some more about these next time. And these will also uh, occur in, in my student presentation, I believe. So, so O of one is big, and not only is O of one big, uh, this thing is actually, in some sense, ample. So for every pseudo-coherent, oh, I should have said um, somewhere uh, that this thing is, why is this thing an attic space? It's an attic space because it's built out of stably uniform pieces. Um, um, and the construction is similar to the one that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. If you take a, one of these, if you take one of the, the Affinoid spaces that you use to build this thing, which will again, uh, will have the same sort of formula. I can find the slide and temporarily show it to you. Um, so if I temporarily bring this slide back, if you, so the formulas for the affinoids that cover this thing again have this form. Um, this is no longer going to have any nice Noetherian property, but you can again compare um, these to perfectoid things by throwing in, for example, roots of P as necessary. Um, and that will let you show that things are stably uniform. Um, so you sort of show that these things are stably uniform by comparison to some perfectoid, to a suitable for These are not perfectoid spaces, but you compare them to a suitable perfectoid space to show that they're, str that they're stably uniform. So then it makes sense to talk about pseudo-coherent sheaves, say, or vector bundles, if that's all you want. So if you have a sheaf on this thing, um, this thing is generated, if you twist by a large power of O of 1, this is generated by global sections for n sufficiently large. But this is a non-trivial result. I should write the theorem here. And maybe I should say this is from joint work I've been talking about. Um, OK, so let me introduce one additional class of bundles. And then let me state, and maybe this, that'll be a good place to stop, but the classification of vector bundles over an algebraically closed field. Uh, actually, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something else. Um, yeah, so actually, let me say something else first and maybe postpone that for the start of next time. So over a point. So i.e. r is a field, say r plus is r circle. Um, we, uh, one has a notion of uh, degrees of vector bundles. So it turns out that the, the Picard group, the, the pick zero of this thing, um, can be expressed as degree zero divisors modulo principal ones. And there's a degree map that takes 
uh, uh, that sort of assigns the deg a degree to each of these things. And it will turn out that um, O of n has degree n under this correspondence. So O of 1 will turn out to have, if you take a non-zero section of O of 1, it will have sort of a simple 0. Um, well, yeah, and that, will, that simple 0 will correspond to some untilt. So you can, so if you have a notion of degree of line bundles, you can define the degree of any vector bundle. In the same way that you formally do in the usual theory of vector bundles on curves, um, you just replace V with its uh, top exterior power. That's a line bundle, and you just take the degree of that. Um, so this is, this is sometimes called the determinant bundle associated to V. So this is sometimes called det v, or degree of this thing, which is called determinant of v, for obvious reasons. Um, so one defines the slope of a bundle as its of a non-zero bundle as its degree divided by its rank. This is again what you do in geometric invariant theory. And you say that V is semi-stable if V has no uh, non-zero uh, proper sub-bundles, sub-bundle W, whose slope is strictly larger than V. So it's a negative condition. It says there isn't a sum bundle that has so property. Um, and it's. Sorry. Yes. Um, sorry, this is pick, uh, and this is div, sorry. Right, yeah. So, for example, so if, if, if I think an algebraically closed field, then pick zero will actually be trivial, and this will only be z. So yeah, the semi this notion of semi-stability is in some sense a negative condition. It's defined by the absence of something. But it turns out that there is actually a positive uh, interpretation of this condition. So uh, so it turns out that the semi-stable vector bundles uh, on so again, uh, S is spa R R plus, where R is a field. The, ve the semi-stable vector bundles on this thing of degree 0 say, are in one-to-one -one correspondence in a very natural way with um, continuous representations of the absolute Galois group of, of the field R, which maybe I should have called F or something. Maybe I'll call it F, so I can write GF, on a finite dimensional QP vector space. And I'll tell you what the vector space is. If I take a, ve if I take a, a bundle here, then the corresponding vector space will be GF act with its GF action, it will be I take the, the farg fontaine curve over a completed algebraic closure of F. Um, I'll write X instead of FF so that there's only notation isn't a mess. Um, and the pullback, I should write the pullback of V, but I'll just write V here. So you take V, you pull it back to the farg fontaine curve over a, a completed algebraic closure, and then this turns out to be a finite dimensional QP vector space. Um, and then by functoriality, there's an action of the Galois group of F, and this is actually the representation that you get. So, yeah. 
And the point that I wanted to end with, I guess I'll end with this, um, this is a, analogous to a famous theorem of Narasimhan and Sishadri on um, vector bundles on Riemann surfaces vis-a-vis uh, representa unitary representations, representations of the fundamental group. So there's this classical theorem in the theory of Riemann surfaces that says that vector bundles on a compact Riemann surface, which are semi-stable of degree zero, have an interpretation in terms of unitary representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface on a finite dimensional C vector space. And so that's a, that's a positive interpretation of this negative condition. And this theorem lets you recover the, the sort of Fontaine et al. theory of uh, phi gamma modules on, uh, by taking, for example, F to be the QP cyclotomic extension. But you could take F to be something else entirely and get some variation of that. Um, and it also allows you to relev relativize, but I'll save that for for next hour. So next hour we'll talk about, I'm sorry? Oh, this theorem, that's a good point. So this theorem has been proved a couple of different times. So it includes, so, okay, I'll take this as a, so this will be a, the first question, I guess. So this includes a, this is basically, the, the key content here is a classification theorem for the vector bundles on farg fontaine curve over an algebraically closed field. That's somehow how you get this part out. Um, that classification theorem has an interesting history. So, um, it, so in this language, it was proved by Farg and Fontaine using, if I remember correctly, the theory of bonnot colmez spaces. Um, but it turns out that, um, un unknown to every, anybody at the time, although maybe we should have all realized this, or sooner, this is equivalent to an older theorem of mine that was formulated in a different language. So I originally proved essentially this in the language of certain power series rings, um, or called robo rings. So essentially, I was working with uh, this, these objects rather than these objects because I didn't I didn't know about the existence of this space at the time. So I had these objects. Uh, with our modules of global sections, really. This is like a Stein space, so you can sort of take global sections um, in, a, in a reasonable way. So I was working with these objects, and I had a classification theorem for these objects over an algebraically closed perfectoid field. You could say perfectoid at the time. Um, uh, and it was clear at the time to various people that this had this kind of resemblance but it wasn't until Farg and Fontaine figured out how to actually define a geometric object that we could make it literally a classification theorem about vector bundles on a curve, on a curve, um, and then have the picture look really closely analogous to the Raymond surface situation. So the theorem was sort of proved more than once different ways. I mean, the proofs are formally similar, but technically different. Um, uh, but again, this is a, good, a consequence of the fact that, you know, uh, if an idea is sufficiently good, people will arrive at it in multiple different ways, and then we'll all figure out that we got to the same place. So I'll stop there for now. Uh, further questions? Um, in this last thing you stated, you say there's this correspondence with unitary pi one representations. Is there any analog of this unitary condition uh, in the objects in this correspondence on the uh, Farg-Fontaine curve? Um, so the short answer is I don't know, but a slightly longer answer is my guess is that the reason, in some sense, the reason why these have to be unitary is somehow analogous to the fact that these things have to be representations of, of a Galois group and not something like a Vey group. Um, so this is, right, um, you know, this is some sort of for enforcing some kind of compactness. This is, again, a profinite group. Um, 
So I don't have a, there's not, I mean, on both sides, it's sort of messy to try to extend to non-semi-stable objects. But for example, if you take rank one objects, um, you can say something about, you could sort of extend this co comparison to rank one objects, which are no longer uh, semi-stable by replacing GF with some sort of V group. Um, I don't remember whether that's true here. I think something like that is true on rank for rank one bundles on Riemann surfaces also. Um, but we don't have a, a higher dimensional version of that statement. I think there was another question over on this side. So what is the class of um, vector bundles that should correspond to Durham rep representations or like geometric ones? So uh, yeah, you can interpret. Uh, so once you have this sort of interpretation of uh, ve representations in terms of vector bundles, you can start asking about conditions that come from p-adic Hodge theory, like Durham. So it turns out the way Durham works is um, if since you start with you know Durham representations are defined in terms of um, you have not just a characteristic p-field but actually an untilt of it, like tuple CP or something. Um, so that will pick out, uh, uh, that will give you the data of a farg fontaine curve plus a distinguished point on it. And the Durham condition turns out to be some sort of condition on the formal neighborhood of that point. I won't say more than that right now, but um, I think maybe the, you might, this might be touched upon very briefly in the problem set. Any other questions? Oh, that's a question. So this is really an analog of Bayes' theorem, isn't it? I mean, the way you stated, uh, I mean, because you, you, if I understood you correctly, you say we don't know how to capture unitarity, so. Well, I mean, this is as much as I can, as I said, I don't know um, what happens if I try to replace GF by something slightly smaller. Um, and I, I like, well, this might be my ignorance, but I don't know what happens here when you drop unitary, by my understanding is it gets kind of complicated. Oh, sorry, there's a question. Let's take the mic back there. Uh, when you drop unitary, what you get is uh, modularized spaces of Higgs bundles on the Riemann surface side. Right, so you could try to extend this. So there is a, there is a notion of the Simpson correspondence, um, uh, I guess originated by Faultings and studied a lot by Abess and, and Gro and so on. Um, so there is, a, there is a Simpson correspondence in this context that one could try to, to reproduce here, but I haven't really thought about this. I mean, if you, there's a, well, we could talk more about this offline. Okay, I think we better end the questions there, but let's thank uh, Kiran again. And uh, before you all get out of here, just very quickly, uh, today is John Tate's 92nd birthday. So I thought on the count of three, you could wish him a happy birthday and I could film it. We could send it to him. <laughs> We've done this before and he gets a kick out of it. So.